Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Treacle Matter, your nostalgic connection, where we take a look at a variety of people, places, and things from the past through a sticky sweet veil of nostalgia. I'm your host, Joseph Nocera, and today we've got an excellent 80s-themed episode for you. Fuck off! Our nostalgic person was perhaps the most popular star from the 80s, the absolutely epic Harrison Ford. As of 2019, his films have grossed over $9 billion worldwide making him number four on the list of highest grossing box office stars of all time. Though his career began in the 60s, and he achieved legendary status in 1977 for playing Han Solo in the first Star Wars film, as we entered the 80s, his star continued to rise with two more Star Wars films, The Empire Strikes Bass, <laughs> Strikes. The Empire Strikes Bass, The Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi. But Ford is perhaps best known for his Indiana Jones series of films, starting with Raiders of the Lost Ark, Temple of Doom, and The Last Crusade. These films saw massive success as mentioned before, and also saw novelization, toys, and video game adaptations. His other successful films from the 80s include Blade Runner, Witness, and Working Girl, for which he received an Academy Award nomination for Best Actor. He's been very active and successful in the decades that followed, even reprising his role as Han Solo in the recent Star Wars films, The Force Awakens and The Rise of Skywalker. So what do you think of Harrison Ford? Do you remember his rise to stardom in the late 70s and 80s? What's your favorite of his films? Statistics suggest that you've seen at least one of them. Our nostalgic place also got its start in the late 70s and still exists today, but undoubtedly reached its heyday in the 80s. Let's talk about every 80s kid's haven, the video game arcade. Categorized as coin-operated interactive video cabinets, this popular pastime was accessible via quarters, buttons, and joysticks. Expansion for these pocket change paradises doubled from 1980 to 1982 to 13,000 locations across the US compared to the 4,000 remaining today. Popular games of the era included Space Invaders, Galaxian, Asteroids, Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, Frogger, Galaga, Centipede, Miss Pac-Man, Dig Dug, Donkey Kong Jr., Qbert, Tron, Mario Brothers, Paperboy, Punch-Out, and dozens more. Pac-Man in particular became so culturally impactful, referred to as Pac-Mania, it inspired the hit song Pac-Man Fever, an animated television series produced by Hanna-Barbera in 1982, and even a General Mills sugary breakfast cereal. The arcade became the place to be for teens in the 80s and spawned several themed locations, the most popular of which being Chuck E. Cheese, which we talked about in episode 9 during our 90s special. It was a hub for socialization, rowdy behavior, and was often frequented instead of school. However, the video game crash of 1983 and the subsequent rise of quality home consoles kicked off by the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1985 brought the decline in popularity of video game arcades. Do you have memories of playing video games at the arcade back in the day? Let us know. Today's nostalgic thing is an 80s staple, a parody of another popular toy, and surprised many with its rise to immense popularity. Garbage Pail Kids is a series of trading cards by Topps and brainchild of Pulitzer Prize-winning cartoonist Art Spiegelman. It started as a spoof of the Cabbage Patch Kids, a line of one-of-a-kind dolls that reached unprecedented levels of popularity in the early 80s, setting all sorts of sales records, and since becoming the longest-running doll franchise in America. With its quickie, with its squeaky clean image, Garbage Pail Kids flew in the face of Cabbage Patch Kids, using their likeness but with graphic and disgusting imagery and humorous wordplay. This resulted in a lawsuit for copyright infringement, and in an out-of-court settlement, Garbage Pail Kids agreed to modify the designs. At the height of their popularity, these sticker cards spawned both a television series, motion picture, and the cards were often banned from schools. Some of the most horrendous and desirable cards include Buggy Betty, Hothead Harvey, Dead Fred, Jay Decay, Schizo Fran, Stinky Stan, Soft Boiled Sam, Semi Colin, Corroded Carl, Nasty Nick, and perhaps the most famous of all, Adam Bomb. Some of these original cards can fetch close to $10,000. By the late 80s, <laughs> what a guy. By the late 80s, the fad faded, but the cards have seen re-releases and new additions in recent decades. Did you get caught up in the Garbage Pail Kids craze? Did your folks hate them? Let us know your experience in the comments. Known as one of the biggest marketing blunders of all time, 
Our retro commercial for today is one of many ads for this infamous product, and this particular ad features an even more infamous person you'll recognize from last episode. Attention Pepsi drinkers, introducing the new taste of Coca-Cola, the best Coca-Cola ever. That's all I'm going to say. In fact, that's all I have to say. No more words. This stuff is great. I'm sorry. I'm really, I'm sorry. Whew. In 1985, Coca-Cola was a year away from their centennial. During what is known as the Cola Wars, they developed an updated version of their classic beverage, and in blind taste tests, this new formula outperformed both Pepsi and their own classic Coca-Cola formula. They announced that they were replacing their iconic and legendary beverage, debuting new Coke in the spring of 85, much to the dismay of the American public. Though the beverage had won in taste tests, Coca-Cola hadn't accounted for the power of nostalgia and the loyalty they instilled in their consumers over the past 99 years. To say there was backlash would be an understatement. People were outraged and demanded classic Coke return to the shelves. By July of that same year, it was a new Coke was renamed Coke 2 and would be discontinued by 2002. Now, almost 40 years later, nostalgia for the blunder itself has increased, and it's been featured on several YouTube channels and on the popular show Stranger Things. This led to New Coke again hitting the shelves with a limited release. So, do you remember New Coke? Did you like it? Were you appalled Coca-Cola would do such a thing? Share your thoughts down below. Can somebody out there tell me why Coke did it? Why they changed? First, they said they were the real thing. Then they said they were it. Then kablooey, they changed. So now, I'm going to try my first Pepsi. But I still want to know why Coke changed. Mm. Now I know why. Pepsi, the choice of a new generation. Today's animation sensation is beloved by millions of kids and teens of the 80s. Thunder! 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 Thundercats! Ho! Thundercats. Now, I'll admit I did not grow up with this show, but I've always heard about it and know that people love it. So I recently checked it out and even without growing up with it, I can definitely appreciate the nostalgia. Anyone who knows me knows I love anything produced by Rankin Bass. We talked about Peter Cottontail in episode seven during our Easter special, and they're known for their Christmas classics, which we'll definitely cover when the season is right. But when I found out they were responsible for Thundercats, I was blown away. This was actually their last successful production before they closed down in 1987. But more about the cats. Actually, they're cat humanoid aliens originally from the planet Thundera, who have to make a new life on Third Earth. The characters are Tigra, Panthro, the leader, lion -O, Wily Kit and Wily Cat, Snarf, and of course, the lovely Chitara. Nostalgic knockout? What a guy. lion -O holds the Sword of Omens, which contains the Eye of Thundera, which gives him sight beyond sight and allows him to call the other Thundercats. They are constantly battling off Mumra, a mummified sorcerer and his team of mutant thugs. The show gave way to a TV video, a couple of video games, a line of toys, and the show was even revived in 2011. Although, like I said, I didn't grow up with the series, I've definitely recently become a fan. It's very 80s, very nostalgic, and the animation is amazing. Like many Rankin Bass productions, the animation was outsourced to Japan, so of course it's good. What are your thoughts on the Thundercats? Did you watch this Saturday morning cartoon? Before we continue, let me tell you about our sponsor, Crochet by Deal, offering custom handmade wearable items like scarves and hats to adorable Amy Gurumi lovable creatures at affordable prices. Contact Adelia at crochetbydeal at gmail.com and get 10% off when you place your order today. It's a great gift idea for any age and a chance to support a small business. Crochet by Deal, link is in the description. Also, check out my new music video for my song, Leo and Capricorn, right here on YouTube. It's a unique song even in my own catalog and the visuals came out great and is sure to soothe your mood. You can find this song as well as my other music on Spotify, iTunes, or your favorite streaming platform. Just search Joseph Nocera. It's Joseph with an F. 
Feel free to follow me on Instagram at Joseph Nocera Music, where you'll find even more content and behind the scenes looks at what I'm up to. If you're enjoying Treacle Matter, don't forget to like, share, and comment what makes you nostalgic. You never know, it might be featured in a future episode. And make sure you subscribe and hit the little bell icon so you don't miss a single video. It really helps the channel. If you feel like going the extra mile, you can support the channel by subscribing to my Patreon. Link is in the description. And thanks so much for watching, and now, back to more Treacle Matter. Our nostalgic knockout is a member of the affectionately named Brat Pack, and is thusly a brat princess. Yes, princess. <laughs> the absolutely breathtaking Molly Ringwald. With her red hair, big brown eyes, and full pouty lips, she was many 80s kids and teens first crush. Her first role saw her play Molly in the NBC sitcom The Facts of Life, and she gardened, gardened, <laughs> and she garnered a Golden Globe nomination for her debut film, Tempest. But she became a teen icon from her frequent collaborations with director John Hughes in classic 80s films such as Sixteen Candles, Pretty in Pink, and of course the decade-defining film The Breakfast Club, which we talked about in episode 11. Among other films of the 80s, she also starred alongside Robert Downey Jr. in The Pickup Artist. She also appears topless in the film Malicious, where she plays a crazy stalker. But that was in the 90s. I remember totally having a thing for Molly after seeing her in The Breakfast Club. There's just something about her. Did you have a crush on Molly Ringwald? Probably the single most decade-defining monumental moment in music from the 80s is the song We Are the World by perhaps the largest supergroup ever, USA for Africa. Written by Michael Jackson, who we covered in episode 13, and Lionel Richie and produced by the legendary Quincy Jones, this song became the anthem for the latter part of the decade. It featured some of the biggest talents in music, spanning all sorts of genres, and comprised of over 40 performers including Stevie Wonder, Paul Simon, Kenny Rogers, James Ingram, Tina Turner, Billy Joel, Diana Ross, Dionne Warwick, Willie Nelson, Al Jarreau, Bruce Springsteen, Kenny Loggins, Steve Perry, Daryl Hall, John Oates, Huey Lewis, Cindy Lauper, Bob Dylan, Ray Charles, Bette Midler, Harry Belafonte, Dan Aykroyd, Lindsey Buckingham, and even more. It's considered a charity single, and with sales over 20 million, is the eighth best-selling physical single of all time. It was actually Harry Belafonte's idea to assemble the generation's biggest known stars in an effort to raise money for Africa. Although the song was a hit commercially, it was criticized for sounding too much like a Pepsi jingle with the lyric, there's a choice we're making. Yes, and it's the choice of a new generation. And of course, Michael Jackson was a spokesperson for Pepsi at the time, which we discussed in episode four. But the song and music video are legendary and is an amazing piece of art involving some of the decade's most influential music performers. Since its release, We Are The World has raised over $63 million for humanitarian causes, equivalent to $149 million today, and 90% has gone to African relief. And as always, our feature presentation is the movie that featured our mystery movie quote from last time. This is my all-time favorite 80s film. Did you know the quote? It was from the teen classic, Fast Times at Richmond High, a hilarious and nostalgic film about coming of age in California in 1982. The cast features many young actors, some of which would go on to become big names in the industry, including Sean Penn, Phoebe Cates, Jennifer Jason Lee, Judge Reinhold, Robert Romanus, Brian Backer, Amanda Wiss, and blink and you'll miss em appearances by Nicolas Cage, Eric Stoltz, Taylor Negron, Forrest Whitaker, and Anthony Edwards, who would go on to appear in 90s series Northern Exposure, then star in the hit TV drama ER. The film has an excellent soundtrack featuring Somebody's Baby by Jackson Brown. And probably the most rewound scene in 80s cinema, where Phoebe Cates takes off her swim top in Judge Reinhold's fantasy dream sequence. Ah, memories. Oh, don't worry, she'll definitely be featured as a nostalgic knockout in a future episode. The dynamic between Mr. Han and Sean Penn's character, Jeff Spicoli, is an absolute riot. And you just can't help but get nostalgic as we're taken through the halls of their high school and the mall where most of them work. There's even a couple of scenes in an arcade. First jobs, first cars, first loves. This film should have been called First Times at Ridgemont High. No? But seriously, this film has everything you could want from an 80s cult classic. Sentimental moments, lots of laughs, sex, drugs, rock and roll, and of course, tons of nostalgia. Oh, and Vincent Schiavelli, who just happens to be in my top three favorite movies, all of which we've covered now. Amadeus in episode two, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest in episode five, and this one. So, have you seen Fast Times at Ridgemont High? If not, you gotta watch it. You won't regret it.
Here's a hilarious mashup I came up with involving Fast Times at Richmond High and another fan favorite comedy. What Jefferson was saying was, hey, you know, we left this England place because it was bogus. So if we don't get some cool rules ourselves, pronto, we'll just be bogus too. Okay? What you've just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. <laughs> I just can't even. And now for our mystery movie quote. Pay attention. All right, I'll give it a try. No. Try not. Do. Or do not. There is no try. Some of you will definitely know this one. Let us know down below. And that wraps up our 80s special. How nostalgic was that? I hope you enjoyed today's content. I hope it brought back memories, made you feel nostalgic, or maybe even showed you something new. This has been Treacle Matter, your nostalgic connection. I'm your host, Joseph Nocera. Thanks so much for watching and please stay tuned for another great nostalgic episode next time. <laughs>